I think it started recording. Okay, so I'm back in the classroom with y'all today um, for the next uh, lecture that's actually starting chapter six. So let me see. We are three days, three, including today, we're three classroom days away from like the end of the midterm cycle. So y'all should have seen my um, announcement on Blackboard with like a schedule of what to expect between whenever I posted it, like, I don't know, Monday maybe I posted that schedule. So, uh, and it's Thursday now. So um, project two is already out there in, um, in Blackboard for you with the instructions and you need essentially um, week five, like all of week five and the first part of week six in order to do, you know, the videos and chapters four and five, you at least need that to do well on project two. And then today, uh, between now and the end of next week, we're going to be covering chapter six and like flipping back and forth to um, chapters four and five also. We're going to talk about socialization again. And then at the end of next week, probably Wednesday or Thursday-ish, Next week, I will make your midterm test available, and you will have until, I can't remember, did I say what the due date was in the announcement? I think I did. So I'm going to go back to that announcement and make sure that I post the due date as I already um, gave it to you. Um, and then that's going to be essentially 50. I haven't made the test yet, but I'm thinking of designing it like it's 50 multiple choice, true, false, short answer, fill in the blank, that kind of that kind of question. If I have like a short answer question, it might be more than two points, um, but it's gonna be a 100 point test. So assume that it's gonna be somewhere around 50 points, 45, que excuse me, not 50 points, 50 questions, 45 questions, 50 questions, something like that. The multiple choice true false ones will be two points and it'll go back to uh, chapter one all the way through chapter six, okay? All righty, so any other logistical questions or anything? Okay. So, um, chapter six is all about deviant behavior. Deviance is how you say it just as like a noun, deviance or deviant behavior. Now, before I dive in and tell you what this is, let me tell you what it isn't because this, uh, I think it's spell check that actually does this. Uh, to people, but um, spell check is a blessing and it's a curse sometimes, isn't it? But this word deviant has a V in it, and there's another word defiant, and defiant means like you go against somebody, like a bratty kid is defiant to their parents. So a lot of times during this chapter, I have noticed over the years that when people are writing a reaction paper or even answering an essay question or something about these, um, this topic, Sometimes they'll put this word in, in its place. Now, I know what you're saying, so I don't ever count off points for this kind of thing. I just want to point out to you because it's a common mistake I have seen. And just make sure that you know, look how closely they are spelled, right? And I think, I think it's the German language, I think. Somebody can text me and tell me, but I think it's the German language where you actually do pronounce an F like a V. Do y'all know? Or is it a W like a V? Anyway, there are some languages where this does sound like a V, but anyway, uh, the, the way we spell it in English is with a V, so don't let your spell check do this to you, okay? So, deviance or deviant behavior is any behavior that goes against that acceptable side of norms. So remember I had that beautiful picture that I drew you where we've got like a fuzzy area of unknowns, we've got an unacceptable side of behaviors according to the culture and to the norms of society, and we have an acceptable side of behaviors. So over here, this is what is expected of us. This range, now I'm kind of circling this area of that um, line that spectrum that I've drawn here, because there's a whole big different range of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. What, the short video that I posted about um, dramaturgical analysis, it has a scenario in there about somebody's dating a guy with tattoos, and uh, her dad doesn't like tattoos, so when the kid meets the parents for the first time, like he covers them all up, right? Because he's trying to, if you haven't watched that video yet, um, you'll get more information about it when you do. Um, because he's trying to get accepted 
by the father and not be rejected immediately. So some of y'all might, you know, might have tattoos. I don't, mainly because I'm a chicken. I don't like pain, and y'all tell me that they hurt. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, uh, but tattoos used to not be accepted at all, like at all, especially not on a female. Do, do y'all know that? Like not, yeah. So in y'all's lifetime, it, it kind of wasn't. Um, wasn't a thing, but only men had tattoos, like back in the 70s and 80s, only men had tattoos in an acceptable way, and if you had, um, if you were a female and you had a tattoo, uh, a lot of people would shun you entirely, and like not, um, not have a good opinion of you at all, uh, but anyway, nowadays, tattoos are perfectly acceptable for most of us, um, Maybe you have some folks in your family who like the scenario in the video you'd have to hide a tattoo from just to keep, keep them quiet, right? But, um, but anyway, this acceptable side is usually, and I've got all these dots in here because there's a wide range of what is or is not accepted. But look over here. There's like a bigger range, isn't there, of kind of the stuff that's not accepted. And in a diverse society such as the United States, with subcultures that have different attitudes and ideas about the way things should be done, then this deviant behavior thing, which is any behavior that goes against norms in society, it goes against the positive side of norms. So it's behavior um, that violates norms the acceptable side of the norms, okay? I think in your textbook when you're reading in chapter six and um, you're reading this definition, it says something like behavior that, that violates, that significantly violates norms or violates significant norms or something like that. I'm not remembering very accurately right now, but there's something about significant norms. So we have to go back to our memory from chapter two, was it, I think, when we learned what norms were for the first time? And there's three different types of norms. Do y'all remember what they were? Put you on the spot. They'll be on the midterm for sure. Three different types of norms, folkways, mores, and laws. Thank you, folkways, mores, and laws. So we learned back then that some norms aren't so, such a big deal at all, and some norms are a huge deal for society, right? So that's what we're talking about with deviant behavior. Typically, deviant behavior labels a person, can label a person as not normal or unacceptable from a social standpoint if they violate significant social norms. Um, for instance, maybe we talked about, as an example of mores, maybe we talked about marital fidelity, being faithful to a marital spouse. Um, we extend that all, also through to like boyfriend and girlfriend relationships or dating relationships in general. Uh, we, we assume exclusivity in that relationship. If we find out that somebody has not been exclusive, is there a significant... Um, label that can go on, you know, that can be placed on that person by their friends. Do they maybe lose some of their friends through a sanction? These kinds of things would, would fall under deviant behavior. They violate norms that are considered important to us. Okay? Okay, so, um, deviant. There are some facts that we wrote down about culture. I don't remember how many weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, we wrote down some facts about culture. That culture um, is different from place to place. Y'all remember this? Culture is specific to a group, like each group tends to have its own ideas about what norms, values, beliefs are. Um, and that, uh, that culture changes over time. So wherever you have that in your notes, you can flip back to it or, you know, make yourself a, a reminder in your notes right now that you need to go back and relate that information to this. But deviant behavior is something that exists in society. Every single society, you have deviant behavior. Sometimes deviant behavior is in a social sense, like cheating on a boyfriend or a girlfriend, like the example that I just gave. And sometimes deviant behavior 
is labeled because of norms called laws, it's labeled as criminal behavior. So crimes and criminal justice, which an entire field that you can go into as a profession or in, um, in academics, crimes are considered deviant behavior. So that, that's also covered in chapter six, crimes. Because of course, laws, those are types of norms. And we said that laws range from not very important at all up to extremely important. And so crimes typically are um, applied, that word typically is applied to the important side of law violation. Technically, it is a crime if you speed and, um, well, technically it's a crime if you speed in general. I was about to say if you speed and get a ticket, but that implies only if you get caught <laughs> that, it's, um, <laughs> that it's a deviant behavior. But anyway, um, crimes are usually applied to the laws, that, that uh, type of norms. And crimes are different, or what we consider to be lawful is different from one place to the next. So this is where it ties back into, um, it ties back into uh, culture being different from one place to the next, culture being relevant to the group. Those people who maybe do not like tattoos, do not accept tattoos, like in the scenario in that video, would think that if you had a tattoo, you're deviant, but you yourself, your peer group, um, in, in your immediate social group, maybe does not consider that to be deviant behavior. So it's kind of like, have you heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? If you've heard that cliche before, think of deviant behavior as that also. Because if you come from a subculture that this behavior is perfectly fine and acceptable, but I come from a subculture that says absolutely no to that behavior, then I'm going to think of you as deviant, and you're going to think of me as, I don't know, judgmental, ethnocentric, label me, right? So that's going to bring about, um, it can bring about fences, bring about walls between us, right? And so that's where some of these subcultural differences um, can happen. Okay, so in that section where you have all those, those three facts about culture, you can technically, it's still true, if you took those sentences that you wrote back then and crossed out the word culture and put the word deviance in there, all of those statements are still true, okay? Because this has to do with norms, a huge part of culture, so deviance is part of culture also. Now, one of those facts about norms has like a deeper meaning to it, or facts about culture has a deeper meaning to it. It was the one, I don't remember how we worded it at the time, but we said that culture changes over time. So let's look at that for just a second. Deviant behavior, we can cross out the word culture, and we can put the word deviant behavior in there, and we can say deviant behavior changes over time. That means the macro scale ideas about what is or is not acceptable changes over time, okay? So um, for instance, this is an old example, but maybe um, still relevant in stuff that you've studied before, divorce in society, divorce in Christian society at least, which we have a Christian um, society in the United States, divorce used to be extremely over here, right? Divorce was not acceptable from a social sense, not just in a religious sense that some of us still do not accept divorce, even from a religious sense, but from a social sense, divorce used to be way over here. I don't know where, like way over here, okay? But nowadays, and certainly in your lifetime, um, you might think how bizarre that sounds. Wow, divorce was really unacceptable. Divorce was considered deviant behavior because probably in your lifetime, you know many of your peers growing up from kindergarten on through high school and, and college who come from homes that, of divorced parents. So it's been like a normal kind of perspective in your lifetime. And don't ask me what specifically changed about our culture or about our ideas of deviant behavior in that time frame so that divorce is more commonly accepted. Just like uh, birth childbearing and birth out of marriage, call it wedlock, there's another situation 
that has um, significantly changed since I was your age and certainly since your grandparents were your age. I'm, I'm probably in between your mamas and your grandmamas in my age. But anyway, since we were um, your age, that's definitely something that has gone from this side to way more this side. There's not a stigma associated with it as much. Stigma is a word that I believe was first introduced in chapter four. It's a label that we get in society that um, identifies us as a negative thing. We have some kind of negative label that we bear. You might have uh, had the, the novel in high school, you might have been asked to read The Scarlet Letter. I read that. The Scarlet Letter is this idea, another, another day in time when culture was different, right? When a woman committed adultery, she was a single woman who had sex outside of marriage and they found out and they put it literally the scarlet letter um, on her dress and made her wear it. That was like an outward sign um, of a stigma. This person is tainted. This person has um, negative issues that you should associate with them. That's what used to happen with uh, females who got pregnant outside of marriage. Does that happen anymore? No. So culture changes over time, deviant behavior changes over time, but let's look a little bit deeper into that statement that deviant uh, changes over time and culture changes over time. And let me rearrange it really quick and ask you this question. Can deviants cause culture change. Can deviance cause culture change to happen? What made divorce more acceptable over time? What made unwed motherhood acceptable over time? What made tattoos acceptable over time? Et cetera, et cetera. Keep on filling in the blank. What made all of these things that maybe you know back in the day, I love it when y'all, you young people say back in the day, I'm like, what are you talking about, 2011? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, back in the day to me is like 1972, you know, but, uh, but anyway, what made things change over time? Uh, can deviance, deviant behavior in general, what do you think? I think in some aspects, um, if more people start doing it, it's like more commonly accepted. If more people start doing it, it's more commonly accepted. Y'all think she's on the right track there? It certainly can become more commonly accepted over time, right, from a social standpoint. Um, so, so yes, I think that that's spot on why deviance can cause social change. And as a matter of fact, I used to, there is a chapter toward the end of the textbook, I think it's chapter 15 or 16, on social change, like social movements and social change. And that, that's exactly what it, it looks like, uh, or that's exactly what it covers, is a lot of different circumstances in our history when you see deviant behavior used as a tool to bring about social change. Yes, ma'am. Also, I don't remember exactly which, but it was in a past few lectures, uh, how we accept it now, like we learn to, uh, like not judge it, instead of like just be okay with it. Oh, uh, ethnocentrism? When we were talking about ethnocentrism? Yes, okay, so yes, I, I don't think that the video picked up your voice, so let me kind of repeat this. You said a few lectures ago we were talking about being more accepting and like learning more tolerance over time too. Yeah. Yes, and so that's part of really what the education system in our agents of socialization, it does for us. So, for instance, in our socialization process, we are with our family unit my air quotes there, we're with our family unit, but do we, let me see, how do I, is the family the only agent of socialization that teaches us? No, is the correct answer. I see y'all going, no. Um, no, we have other agents of socialization, like pretty much right away alongside the family. Do you think mass media, if you look at mass media as TV and movies and music and 
you know, video games. Yeah, that's right alongside family. Um, peer groups, whether you're playing around with your cousins in the playpen or the people at the um, daycare, peer groups also begin to be, and other um, authority figures, so to speak, like daycare workers and things like that. If you are a churchgoer, you've got more exposure to other people. When you go out to the grocery store with your mama and your three, you've got more exposure to other people. We have all kinds of learning experiences that give us exposure to different things, but not necessarily exposure to be tolerant of differences that are outside the scope of that family condition. Because the family controls really, or is supposed to, anyways, again with my air quotes, it's supposed to control uh, the, your media intake, it's supposed to control who your peer groups are, it's supposed to like have some kind of um, control over you and your upbringing. But, deviant behavior, like you're not a cookie cutter copy of the previous generation. Culture changes over time anyway. Where do you get those differences? Where do you get those changes? From the additional life experiences that you get and also a school curriculum. Also being in a school classroom on the micro scale with people from all different backgrounds, all different creeds, as we say. And so that can breed tolerance and it can make things more acceptable over time make things much more acceptable over time. But society, you know, that's on a, like a micro scale. It makes us more acceptable on a micro scale over time. And from a symbolic interactionist perspective, society in general over time will therefore become more tolerant because we build it from the small scale interactions up, right? But from a functional perspective or a conflict perspective, remember functionalists, well, I won't say, remember, I'll ask you to tell me. What do functionalists think about change? I remember addressing this because somebody, somebody wrote about this in a reaction paper. Two or three people did, and I remember addressing this in class. What does a functionalist think about change? Change will occur slowly over time, but as one thing changes, so will um, affect other factors. Excellent, and I love how you had your hand motions there because you're like thinking macro scale and you're showing me also with the way you're moving. Yes, so functionalism, what she said was, functionalist thing that thinks that change is going to happen over time. So essentially what we said, we have a fact about culture, culture changes over time, right? Functionalists say, yes, this is a fact, and culture is going to change over time. As it changes, all of the social institutions that touch each other and prop each other up and make the machine of society work, all of those social institutions are going to change and tweak and adjust over time, just like um, this, the different generations demand as we move through time. So a functionalist says that if deviant behavior is part of society and deviance causes social change, as long, like you said, not, it's not too quick, and uh, all the little tweaks and adjustments can be made over time, then society feels stable and orderly and it just plods along and lo and behold, you're a grandma one day and you see the way that your grandkids behave and what they have resource-wise in society and you're like, wow, now you have a different meaning for back in the day when you say it, when you're in your 60s and 70s. Um, so you'll be like, wow, society changes over time. But the change was gradual, and so it kept slow, stability, order, moving forward. What does a conflict theorist say about change, and maybe about deviant behavior, too, with change? What do you think? Conflict theory, the haves and the have-nots. Change has to happen because there is no quality in, because of resources or or background or 
Good. Okay. Yes. I was a little bit choppy like my, like I speak, a little choppy, but I followed you. So yes. So the haves and the have nots is about inequality in society. And so a conflict theorist would say, yes, we have to change because we can't leave society like that, right? We've got to figure out ways to bring things into um, equality, whether it's sharing resources. What else did you say? You said something about resources or something. You, you gave a couple of examples, right? But that's what a, a conflict theorist would say. If you have to use deviance in order to bring about change, then they don't really care. Conflict theorist doesn't really care about whether change is gradual. And, and probably, I think that a conflict theorist would want change to happen like right now. And, you know, who cares if it causes a little chaos for a while? We will come to uh, you know, an equilibrium later. Yeah, so um, deviance can cause culture to change in a variety of ways. On the macro scale, deviance can be used as a tool for social change. For instance, we just had the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. Did y'all have any of your classes talk about that when the date came? Oh, they didn't? Well, they should have. I, um, I think I did in one of my sections, but I'm talking about it now, right? So females got the right to vote. Just those words, that I, the way I put it, they won the right to vote. They had to fight for the right to vote. Does that sound like the way I'm wording that, a conflict theorist would be all over it? Yes, because we are highlighting inequality that existed that someone had to force. I say someone, that sounds like I'm talking pretty micro level, I don't mean to, Group, large groups of people had to band together to call attention to their social category altogether and demand social change. There were marches, there were boycotts, there were sit-ins, there were all kinds of protest behaviors to call attention to injustice in order to force society to change toward equality, right? So. So yeah, deviance can be used as a tool for culture change. Deviance, from a functionalist standpoint, is part of society, part of a regular part of society, because culture has to change over time in order to keep everything stable, and deviance can bring about that change. Right? So, um, so yeah, deviance is a key thing because... Um, because of all these reasons, and also thinking back to chapter four and five about social groups and social structure in general, um, and, and dramaturgical analysis or uh, impression management, um, typically, if we if we accidentally do something that is outside this acceptable range for the people in our immediate social group. Um, using the dramaturgical analysis, typically people will engage in face-saving behavior. If you haven't seen that video yet, if you haven't uh, learned about that type of behavior in dramaturgical analysis yet, but face-saving behavior, if you accidentally do something that's outside the norm, your immediate social group is not going to like it. If you intentionally do something outside the social norm, they're for sure not going to like it. If you accidentally do it, they will be more accepting of you, but you have to save face. You have to like redeem yourself for doing that. So for instance, a silly, a silly thing, um, and it's not even a, a social group necessarily, it's just like general social acceptance. I don't have, I didn't bring my purse in here with me, but I don't think debit cards do have raised numbers on them anymore, do they? I'll tell y'all this story anyway. I had my debit card back in the day when it had raised numbers on it, and I was scraping my fingernail across it while I was waiting in line at the grocery store wherever I was. And this little girl, I scraped my fingernail across it, and just once, I guess, I don't know, I was impatient, and I scraped my fingernail like harder along it, and it sounded just like this. Just like that. What else does that sound like? <laughs> right? This little bitty girl in front of me turned around and, and she looked at me with these big eyes and she turned around to her mother and she said, Mama, that lady just farted! Like really, really loud. Is that 
typical front stage behavior that you're supposed to do in public? No, that's not part of the front stage behavior that an actor is supposed to do in public, even at your house, where backstage behavior is usually accepted. Um, you know, you're kind of not supposed to do that, <laughs> you know, just in the living room or something. There's a place and there's privacy, right? So immediately I was embarrassed. I think I'm turning embarrassed right now because I know this is being recorded and I'm thinking I'm about to put the word fart on YouTube. But <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, this little girl, mama, this just happened. And I thought, okay, great. This is outside the scope of what's normal for my behavior in public. So you could call it deviant behavior. But I knew I didn't really do it. Immediately, I went into face-saving mode. And I, I kind of like more obviously held my fingers out with my credit card, running my fingernail across those raised numbers to try to make the sound exactly the same again so the little girl would see it wasn't me. And I, want, I want to be redeemed here, right? I don't, I don't do that in public if I can help it. Like it's an extreme you know, emergency if that happens in public, right? So these kinds of things on a micro scale can cause us to jump into that micro scale management of our behavior and trying to redeem ourselves in front of our immediate social group so that we continue to be on the acceptable side of what they say is acceptable in their behavior um, and not, you know, or not. Um, so anyway, deviance, it can be used as these examples on the macro scale when social change in general and structural change happens. So anything in any of the civil rights uh, social movements that have happened, of course during the civil rights era, but during the women's right to vote and during all of the, um, the sit-ins and protests during uh, the civil rights era, and even now, with the defund the police um, protests, whether you agree or disagree with those, we can look at that as deviance being used collectively on the macro scale to bring about, forcibly bring about social change. Right? So it's a key tool, whether you're looking at um, micro scale behavior or macro scale behavior. Y'all have any comments or questions while I'm erasing? No? Okay. Okay, so since we just finished talking about um, social groups, social organizations, and our micro scale behavior in it, I'm going to kind of skip around in chapter six and jump to the part that talks about symbolic interactionism, our micro level analysis of human behavior, um, symbolic interactionism and deviance, okay? So micro, it's not large enough, I think for, so micro scale behavior, deviance, and I guess I will say social reality in this case, um, is the scenario we're going to talk about. There is a widely accepted micro scale theory uh, developed by a sociologist named William Chambliss. I don't remember what year it was. It was like the 1970s or 80s sometime. He developed this concept um, called labeling theory. regarding deviance and microscale behavior, he used labeling theory to, to develop this, um, this concept we're gonna talk about. So he is famous, his work is known as this report called The Saints and the Roughnecks. Okay, Saints and the Roughnecks. So this goes back to in-groups, out-groups, and reference groups, like one of our recent videos covered. Okay? 
So, a little bit about this, and you can read about it in Chapter 6, look it up online. Uh, William Chambliss was doing some micro-scale research in a high school. I think it was Philadelphia or something. I really can't remember. Uh, not important where. But um, he did some research uh, with school teachers looking to see how do they interact with the students. And he noticed over time that the teachers kind of, these were his labels, okay? These were the names that he used in his study. The teachers didn't necessarily use these labels for their students. But he noticed that the teachers kind of, in his observation, classified students as two different types of people, the saints and the roughnecks. Now, which one do you think probably got the benefit of the doubt from the teachers, and which one do you think probably did not get the benefit of the doubt from teachers, just by the names here? So here's, here's where the microscale analysis starts, right? Saints, obviously, there's halos involved, and you can do no wrong. And roughnecks, like, that's not a common word that we use anymore in modern language, but it's not nice, right? Okay, so this sociologist noticed that teachers kind of had this classification of different people. The saints typically had more expensive clothing. They had a different area of town where they lived. Maybe parents who were in the business world and maybe known in, in the town. This kind of stuff would classify saints. Roughnecks, no. They maybe had a different part of town they came from. They didn't have new cars. They didn't have newish clothes. Maybe they came from a more impoverished family typically. And so this is the way that he observed teachers kind of classified these two groups of students. So he noticed, and this is high school, so let me ask you this question. Do you, does everybody follow rules in high school? Like how, maybe, I didn't even ask that question correctly. Like how many people do you know who followed every rule in high school? Like zero, right? So in other words, in high school, like all of us, yes, I skipped as often as I could get away with it, okay? Confession. Um, yes, all of us break rules throughout our lives, but high school seems to be the time when like you're testing it the most, I think, um, in my unscientific uh, estimation there. Uh, so anyway, he's talking about high school, high school teachers, and you're talking about two different classifications of students both of whom break rules, both of whom do things that could be considered naughty, right? Not even breaking the rules, but just, you know, just bad. But what happened was when the teachers caught these people doing something wrong, their response, here's where our social reality comes in, their response, the way they reacted to it, their social script was so different than these folks, that it result. Therefore, these people's behavior back at the teachers and these people's behavior back at the teachers, because we're like playing off those parts that we play in society, that status and that role thing that we have in society. These folks, if they got caught skipping, since I used that a minute ago, so if they got caught coming back to campus or trying to leave campus, and a teacher had to talk to them about it, he noticed that the talk would go something like this. I can't believe that you're doing this. I caught you. You better be glad that I caught you because somebody else maybe would have put you in detention or you would have had a permanent mark. Why are you doing this? Your big brother wouldn't do it. What would your father say? These kinds of things. Shame on you. Go back to class. I'm going to pretend that this didn't happen. They would get that reaction. This group, on the other hand, I knew that I, I caught you. I knew it. I was just waiting for it to happen detention on every Saturday for three weeks, and maybe in that detention you're going to be thinking about, you know, how you could go another path and you need to maybe choose the next path the next time. Detention. What do you think, if, if I was that teacher, what group of students would be friendly to me over time? What group of students would be at least suspicious, if not downright unfriendly, at least suspicious? So therefore, they're going to act sneaky. Oh, they see me in the hallway. Let me walk the other way because that lady's out to get me. And therefore, I'm more suspicious of you because you're obviously trying to skirt around me so I don't see what you're doing. So we're playing off this social script. Who wrote it? We did. Who can change it? We can. 
But what ends up happening in what William Chambliss said labeling theory does is the way that we initially are labeled. So if the roughnecks have primary deviance, um, is one of the terms in um, this labeling theory, primary deviance, the first time we are deviant, and maybe the first time we are deviant doesn't even have anything to do with our behavior, but the symbolism of, like I said, less resources in the household, not designer clothes or whatever, you know, the look of not being mainstream, whatever you want to say. Maybe it's not even an action on their part other than growing their hair a certain way, showing a tattoo, wearing ripped clothes or whatever, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't an active behavior on their part, but already the teacher has labeled them as, I better watch them because they don't look normal, they don't look trustworthy, so I'm gonna watch them more often. Then, if finally I do catch you doing something because I was watching you more carefully than if I was watching somebody else, and I caught you, I knew I would, I was just waiting for this moment, I'm going to teach you a lesson. You'll be able to think about this. This kind of behavior reaction to these folks can tell them, and I, I don't even mean subliminal messages or something, like that's like for your psychology teacher. You will interpret, if I say to you, I was waiting for this to happen, does that tell you with my own words that you had something about you that was, I erased the word deviant, something about you that just said abnormal. Something about you that just said untrustworthy. Something about you that said black sheep, whatever. And then with tertiary deviance, oops, yeah, left out a, left out a, a letter there, tertiary deviance, is the circumstance when this has happened, this has happened, maybe I punished you for skipping class, but now you sneak around me so you won't get in trouble anymore. You accept this idea that not only does that lady think I'm deviant, but maybe I just am. Something about me from the beginning told her that I was deviant, and I did do that, and Maybe I just am deviant, and that's just normal for me. I'm going to redefine what norms are for my group. And if you're just not part of my group, then you just don't understand, and that's just your problem, and we're not going to get along, and I'm going to cause trouble for you because you expect me to. You heard the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy? That's part of labeling theory. What do you think? Have y'all ever, I mean, lots of like teenage movies and stuff like this with like catharsis in them for, for teenage experiences. Um, lots of times you see this kind of dynamic in, in stories um, that are part of our teenage years. Uh, I think that y'all have probably seen this movie even though it's like 40 years old now. Uh, but have you seen The Breakfast Club? About, yeah, you have, okay, as, as young as you are. Um, anyway, it's uh, about a group of high school kids that come from various cliques, the in-group, out-group, reference group kind of discussion that we had um, earlier this week, comes from various cliques. They never would have associated with each other in, um, in regular high school life, but they all ended up in detention together. And you can even look at the way the principal speaks to certain ones of them, the football guy, the preppy girl, whatever the categories are. Um, you know, you can even look at elements of who is, I'm surprised at you that you're here, you know. You just have to put up with it and get out. But these others were kind of expected to be there or they were there for the 17th time or whatever. So anyway, so on the micro scale, we can observe deviance. And deviance in the eyes of this beholder can make you 
feel very separated from me. Nothing in common, no approval there. And especially when it's an authority figure, early on, no matter how grown up we think we are, when we are 13, 14, 15 years old, no matter how grown up we think we are, that experience can really carry through the rest of our lives. This authority figure at some point thought this of me. Therefore, I just don't like authority figures to begin with. I don't like people who make rules and enforce them. I'm not going to follow rules, and that's just going to be my identity moving forward. What do you think? I have a little story. To yes, please tell me a story. Wow. Um, in high school, I had this really, really, um, like, teacher. It was a teacher, and she was really strict. A strict teacher in high yeah. school? Okay. And strict was, in, like, a fair, good way? Yeah. She was strict in a fair, good yeah, way? Yeah, I mean, she wanted, she gave our rules in class, and we weren't supposed to break them, and yeah. many people, well, we didn't do our homework, right? Yeah, but, not doing your homework. And so, she wouldn't accept that, and she wouldn't take any late work, because obviously they're like, oh, we're teaching you for college classes, right? And then, one day, I forgot. And I didn't do it the night before. And you're a saint, right? <laughs> so you were, so I, you forgot your homework, and it's against the rules. And I'm like, oh my god, I left it at home. I made up a whole lie, and I'm like, I left it at home. But I can call my mom, so she will bring it to me, and I'll give it to you in the next class period. But I was planning to do it on the next class period because yeah. I hadn't done it last. So time. you didn't do it at all, no. but you told her you did, just left yeah. it at home. And so she's like, oh no, it's totally fine. Tomorrow, you always turn in everything. You're good. And I'm like, but if it was someone else, if it was somebody else, yeah, because most of my friends are like, oh yeah, she didn't let me turn in my late work, but because it was me and how I had. So out, yeah, so, so even with classroom policies, yeah, so even with those classroom policies, you either turn it in or you don't. You know what? In a little. A little bit of that, I kind of saw myself in that story because you know, Saturday at noon, if your reaction paper's not in, you know gone and I have people text me all the time can I make it up no you know just do it next time right but over time if that really like counts off your points which I try to design mine so it doesn't count off your points if you don't do that too often um, over time if that counts off your points that might be like an educational self-fulfilling prophecy you might be a fine student very very intelligent but if you miss deadlines like that and you get zeros and your grades go down over time, you might think of yourself as not a good student. You might think of yourself as, I don't make good grades anyway, why try, right? I see this a lot um, over my years of mentorship with students. I see that educational self-fulfilling prophecy live out, um, live itself out in some of you in college because of math in particular. For some reason, in the United States, and this is a cultural thing, okay, it's very complicated, I can't explain to you why it's a cultural thing, but there are some societies in the world, China for instance, where a child is expected to do well in every single subject. I don't care if you hate history, I don't care if algebra is not your thing, you will still make an A in it, young lady. Like, this is what you're supposed to do. As a matter of fact, they would never even say that very Estado and say thing I just did, that might not be your thing, right? That's a very United Statesian kind of kind of attitude. In other places, um, you are supposed this you're supposed to be good in school, period. Good in school, period. So um, in the United States I've noticed so often Students will come up through grade school, middle school, high school, and somebody has told them or treated them in a way that they maybe are English people, not math people, or math people, not English people, or science people, not... And this is, this is a cultural thing. We train our population to think that way. And uh, because other populations don't, and everybody's human everywhere, right? So it's a cultural thing. Um, that's really, really fascinating to me. I wish that I had another lifetime to live so that I could, you know, focus on that and maybe try to bring about educational change as far as that goes so that people don't find, you know, sometimes the writing sections in my class, I don't know how to, what, 
proper grammar is. Have you noticed? I don't know how to make a sentence in a pretty way, but um, a lot of times, so I don't ask you to do it. Like, you don't have any points off if you can't put the punctuation and subject verb agreement. To me, that's not important for whether you know sociology, right? Can you tell, can you put your sentence together well enough to explain to me that you know this stuff that we're working on, right? I'm not your comp one teacher. So, um, but some people, because I say, write me 400 words, they would rather stab their eyes out, forgive me that imagery, but they would just rather stab their eyes out than write a 400 word paper over time. I mean, I hear people belly aching, y'all know that word, belly aching. Just, oh, I've got to write Ms. Terrell's paper. Oh, it's just like, you know, they would rather die. But it's, um, that's a learned thing. That's a learned thing. That, that we get at some point in our education system. And it's a cultural thing that other countries look at us as deviant because we allow for that kind of behavior and teach it, train, train each other to behave that way. Anyway, interesting stuff, let me see. Uh, did this, this clock is correct now, is that right? Do I remember that? Huh? Okay, good, so we still have some time. Okay. So, um, let's look at uh, conflict theory and deviance really quick. We've already touched on it, but that was symbolic interactionism and deviance, so let's, let me see, do I want to do conflict or let's do, no, rewind that, let's do functionalism and deviance, because we can talk about social structure and like how the norms from social structure put pressure on us on the micro scale, perhaps put pressure on us, so let's do that. Okay, so, as we know, functionalism um, looks at social structure on the macro scale as like the framework, the skeleton that holds society together, stable and orderly society over time. Okay, so functionalism is the macro scale, social structure oriented um, theory. Um, it's about stability over time. Social stability over time. Okay, so that's what functionalism is. So functionalism and deviance, I want to look at one particular sociologist um, who is a functionalist himself. He looks at social structure as like the guiding framework, social facts, or the patterned way of thinking, feeling, and acting that exists on the social structure level guides our behavior on the micro scale. He's really, you know, he, he's on that train, right? Functionalism. His name is Robert Merton. Robert Merton. <clears throat> Functionalist. He looked at deviance in society, and he wanted to know, or he decided through examining social structure, he decided that, that social structure can actually cause deviant behavior in large portions of society because of the norms that put pressure on us. So he has a theory about deviance as it relates to social structure called structural strain theory. Structural strain theory. And we've talked a lot so far, like since the beginning of the semester, I think you will recall some of the things that go into his theory when we start talking about it. Because he looked primarily at norms on the macro scale, norms about what success means what success in life means to people in our society. This kind of gets to master status, that concept too. Master status. Okay, so let me stop here um, and just ask you what does success mean? Like in our society, when I say in our society, I'm talking about the United States. How do we in the United States as a population, I'm asking this on a, as a macro scale question, how do we as a population 
measure the success of individuals in our society. Any ideas? Okay, well then let me start on the micro scale and ask, do you have anybody in your life encouraging you to come to college? Do you have people encouraging you? Okay, I see lots of nodding. Um, why are they motivated to encourage you to come to college, do you think? So that I can have a better life and live better than they do. So to live a better life, they want you and your generation to have better social conditions for yourself on a micro scale? Okay. So let me ask you again, can you zoom out from that and you have people in your life on a micro scale saying, I want you to have a better life. In general, can I erase this and say better life? What does better life mean in general on a macro scale? Having more money is the answer that I got from the crowd. Having more resources is the answer I got from the crowd. Have you heard of this phrase before? Oops, if I can spell it correctly. <laughs> the American dream. You've heard of that before? The American dream, there's a lot of sociological research about this concept of the American dream, and it is a sociological concept. We do have a sociological definition. And I'll give you the sociological definition right now. We are gonna talk about this a lot in chapter seven, which is after midterm, when we start um, midterm. And remember, when we were talking about master status and achieve status, we mentioned occupation, income, and education as master statuses in a place like the USA, unless you're a woman, and then female is your master status. The American dream has a lot to do with op occupation, education, and income. This American dream is the idea, and here's your sociological definition of it. I don't usually give you a full sentence definition, but here goes. The American dream is the idea that if you play by the rules if you play by the rules, where do the rules come from? Macro scale society. American dream, if you play by the rules, specifically the rules we're talking about here, you work hard. Put in an individual effort and you work hard. Then over time, it's supposed to pay off for you. Over time, it's supposed to pay off for you. And what does pay off mean in the American dream? Right here. That's what it means in the American dream. Right there. Money, resources. Now here's an interesting thing. Because female is usually a master status for all women all over the world. Even though in the United States, education, occupation, and um, income combined is typically considered the master status. Females in the United States still, if you ask them what does the American dream mean, or that first question I asked y'all, what does success in life mean? Females give a different answer than men most often. Anybody have an idea of how females would typically answer? compared to males about the American dream? Females typically tell me and other sociologists when you ask them this question that success in life means a happy family, happy, well-oriented kids, whereas men usually say, well, I've gotten the job that I want, I have some things that I want, and maybe happy family is on there at some point or another because after all, that's a norm in society that you're kind of supposed to be a procreator in society. But females usually say, well, success doesn't mean this to me. It means a happy family. And then I have to ask you, is a happy family free of charge? Are there lots of bills? Are there lots of resources that you need for those kids to be happy? And they still want a different brand of tennis shoes next week. 
right? They still want the new PlayStation game, and they still want this, and they still want that. So what does happy family mean? Honestly, let's break it down a little bit more. It means this. It means this. So that is what Robert Merton was getting at when he looked at social structure. He said, on the structural level, remember norms exist as part of the macro scale social structure. We live them out. We respond to them, either following them or being deviant against them in our macro, micro scale behavior. But he said that stru the structure of our society has this norm about success. You are supposed to work hard. That's part of the American dream, the norm to work hard. And after you work hard and get a good education, it's supposed to pay off with what? Honestly, it pays, up, it pays off with money, monetary success. Status symbols, that was one of our um, vocabulary words in chapter four. You know, a Honda gets you from point A to point B just fine. Wonderful, I love my Honda. But a Mercedes gets you to point A to point B with a different message doesn't it? And so if that message has ever been important to anybody you know or maybe desirable to you, then it's because you are responding to the norms that exist on the structural level about what success means. And Robert Merton said that this structural strain, think of it as pressure on you, it can bring about four types of deviant behaviors. Four types of deviant behaviors. The first type is an innovator or innovation. He said some people innovate. They innovate because they like the idea of money. They like the money idea. They like the way success is measured as far as money goes. But the hard work part, not so much. So there's the innovation. So they do not like the hard work. They want to find a new way. They reject that hard work. They find a new way to get this same goal of money overall. Innovation. So on a micro scale, we can examine innovation and we can say, well, if anybody tries a get rich quick scheme, if anybody tries to work their way, you know, illegally maybe quick get a lot of money, um, then they're working toward money, that part of success, but not the American dream because you are supposed to put in the hard work and time. The American dream is about a lifetime of following norms and it pays off in the end. And uh, like we said a minute ago, if anybody in your life is encouraging you to go to college to have a better life you know, in your lifespan, this is what they're buying into. They're buying into that American dream because in general, the concept is not get rich quick like these folks want. In general, that concept that comes from macro scale norms is work hard, work for your success. And America is set up so that if you work hard, you are gonna be rewarded and you won't get the reward necessarily when you're 22. But when you're 62, you should have a comfortable life back on it and say, I did what's right, I've got some payoff, and my next generation is going to be even better than I was. But if you don't like that length of time, if you want it when you're 22, you maybe you're going to find a new way to do that. It doesn't involve the hard work. He called that innovation. There is another way to be deviant. Uh, and that's called ritualism, or a ritualist, in, in his terminology. And he said rituals don't care about money. They don't care about money. But they will work hard anyway. They will volunteer, they will take a position, they will take a job intentionally that doesn't pay well because they want to be of service. They do not care about the money but they will do the hard work anyway. With ever, without ever any payoff. 
They don't care about the Mercedes. It never crossed their mind. They did not pay attention at all to the status symbols during their socialization process. It's not important to them now. They are deviant to the rest of society because it doesn't matter to them. And they'll do the hard work anyway. It's part of the American dream. Hard work, not, don't care about the payoff. Retreatism is the third type of deviant behavior. A retreatist, you actually learned about in chapter four. Some of the opening pages in chapter four talked about homelessness. Um, and so homelessness is an example of retreatism under certain circumstances. Retreatism, they do not care about the money. That X means they don't care about it. I'm just using that X to mean they don't care. So they don't care about money and material objects and things that in our socialization process we probably learned were markers of success. The difference between that Honda and that Mercedes, that's a marker of a different kind of success, right? They don't care. And they also do not care about the hard work. They don't care about the hard work. They don't care about the money. They still, however, are part of our society, like homeless people. Homeless people do not completely drop out of our society and become hermits or anything. We see homeless people among us. Homeless people rely on us to have a successful lifestyle of their own. You can be a successful homeless person. And as a matter of fact, the kind of retreatism that I'm talking about here, and study, sociological studies have looked at this for decades, a lot of times people who are homeless choose it not because, like, you see um, stereotypes on TV shows, like somebody has a mental disease or something, and therefore they are homeless, like you see on Law and & Order or some kind of thing like that. Um, the vast majority of homeless people have opportunities not to be homeless, but prefer that lifestyle. That's deviant to us, right? Why wouldn't you want your own apartment? Why wouldn't you want your own car, or at least your own bus pass, to get you from point A. Why wouldn't you want to go in the front door of the grocery store rather than around the back to the dumpster? Why? That's deviant to us, but you can have a successful long life doing that. Successful meaning you live a long time, but not successful according to what the American dream is. So there's a stigma. I've erased, a, I've erased the word stigma, but there can be a stigma associated with you if you choose that lifestyle. That would be a retreatist. And then I barely have enough room for our last one, and we're almost out of time. The last kind of person that, or the last kind of deviance um, that Robert Merton identified is called rebellion. And rebellion starts out just like retreatism. Retreat it, rebels don't care about the same kind of success, so they don't care about money being their ultimate goal in life. They also don't want to participate in the American norms of hard work. Instead, they completely reinvent a society of their own. They become unique subcultures of people who are considered very deviant in society. So they recreate new norms and new um, patterns for behaving that don't necessarily exist or, you know, in our scope in mainstream society. When I say our scope, I mean mainstream society. Other social, uh, subcultural groups that are on the acceptable side of norms. So, for instance, um, there, is a, there is a cult group that was in the news, well, maybe maybe it's been when y'all were born, but they were in the news. I need a, need a new example of this, but um, there was a cult group uh, called the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Now, let me be clear. I'm not talking about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah that's headquartered in Utah. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about a cult group that they do not believe that they should work towards success. They money-wise. That's not their group's goal. Their group's goal is to populate heaven. They have this belief in their group 
that they are supposed to populate heaven. And so they don't have like hard work toward earning a paycheck as their norm for behavior. Instead, what their norm for behavior is, the men in that society are supposed to have as many wives as they can afford to have. And when I say afford to have, I don't mean like all the wives are driving Mercedes or have the liberty to drive or be on their own at all. Um, not only are they supposed to have as many wives as they can afford to have, but the wives are supposed to have as many babies as they can have in their entire reproductive lifetime. When does your reproductive lifetime start if you are a female? 12, 13? So that's marriage age for females in this society, in this cult group, right? So there go, they completely rewrote the rules, you see? Completely rewrote the rules, bless you. Um, so they don't care about money as the ultimate goal of their behavior. They don't buy into this work hard and work your way up from the mailroom all the way to the executive offices. They don't have that life goal. Instead, they have a belief system that says their, their purpose on earth is to populate heaven. How do we do that? Have as many babies as you can keep alive. There's enough food and shelter to keep them alive, but not luxury. And there's a significant deviant violation for us also, because in this particular example I'm giving you, um, you know, we have cr a crime called pedophilia. And so if you marry a girl at 12 and begin a sexual relationship with her, then that's a crime according to the rest of society. So this is an, uh, an extreme example that I'm giving you here for rebellion. But Robert Merton said, looking back at macro scale social structure, that it puts strain on some people, some groups of people, and it can bring about these different types of deviant behaviors on the micro scale. What do you think? And you know what? He probably started his theory way back in the day writing a reaction paper for somebody. Right? So, so that's why I have you writing the reaction papers because I just know one of these days I'm going to open it up and I've got the next big theory and 10 years from now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say, this person said this in their reaction paper. And now it's a theory in your sociology book. Okay, so I'm so glad to be here with you today since I've been out of the, out of the classroom so much and y'all text me with any questions as usual and I will see you next time, whether it's at home or in classroom. Bye.